Hi there, my name is David A. Wheeler, and this is an introduction to Metamath and MMJ2. So what are Metamath and MMJ2? Well, Metamath is a system for formalizing and verifying math proofs. Mathematicians are human. They can make mistakes. A verifier greatly increases the likelihood that a proof is correct and also reveals the steps that traditional approaches hide. Now, there are three parts to Metamath itself, the general math language framework, a database of axioms and proven theorems, and finally a basic command line interface tool for manipulating these things. Metamath itself has a very minimal framework for expressing math and proofs about them. There's really only one rule, substitution. That makes it really easy for programs and non-expert humans to follow a proof. One verifier written in Python only takes about 300 lines of code. All the reasoning is done in the proof, not in the algorithms of the verification program. Now, this has, does have some drawbacks. Proofs tend to be longer than alternatives, and there's relatively little automation. So this is not a good tool for proving programs, since programs change. The Proof Explorer of Metamath is based on set.mm, and it's a lot like a modern Principia Mathematica. Using classical logic and standard ZFC set theory axioms, it can derive numbers and their properties and beyond. What's more, the notation is a lot easier to read than Principia Mathematica. And you can click on any step to see exactly what each of those steps mean, and the whole thing's been verified by multiple verifiers. Most Metamath work is based on set.mm. Second part, of course, is what is MMJ2? MMJ2 is just a text editor. It's implemented in Java. What's interesting about it is that it includes several invocable functions that greatly simplify creating Metamath proofs. Both Metamath and MMJ2 software are released under OSI approved open source software licenses. Set.mm itself is in the public domain. Metamath can produce HTML or tech with traditional symbols. To edit formulas, though, you must use ASCII representation, as shown below. In set.mm, which is the normal case, all infix expressions must be surrounded by parentheses, and the parentheses themselves must be surrounded by white space. Function application is itself an infix operator. It's the backtick. Now, there is an exception. A predicate with class parameters is not surrounded by parentheses, and that includes the equal, the not equal, and the is a member of. A key aspect in formulas is variables, uh, because variables can be replaced by other things. Uh, phi, psi, chi, theta uh, represent well-formed formulas. These are sequences or one or more symbols that evaluate to true or false. Capital A, B, C, D, and so on are class variables. Uh, these are a sequence of one or more symbols that may or may not represent a set, and particular numbers are sets. Lowercase x, y, z, or w are set variables, and they can only be substituted with other set variables. In some cases, you may need to declare that variables are distinct. Uh, see the documentation for more information about this. MMJ2, as I mentioned earlier, is basically a text editor. It comes with documentation. Readme.html in particular will tell you how to install it. Uh, it has a little interactive tutorial. And inside the doc directory, uh, the proof assistant GUI detailed info.html file has more information that I find particularly helpful. Right below is a little example of its input format. The first line is special. It has a header that gives the name of the proof, and then a bunch of lines after that. A line beginning with a star is a comment, a line beginning with space is a continuation, and there's a whole bunch of statements. Statements begin with a step ID, colon, dependency list, colon, ref, followed by space, at least one, and then a formula. Step is just a unique step ID. It can be a number, but it has to be a unique identifier for that step. The last step has to be QED, and if you have hypotheses, they have to begin with the letter H. Dependencies are simply a list of the steps that this step depends on. Uh, and finally, ref is the theory or axiom that justifies the step. This is MMJ2. 
we're going to use MMJ2 to prove that the reciprocal of the cotangent is the tangent. And our basic strategy is just to expand tangent and cotangent into sines and cosines and show that they're reciprocals. The top line here is important. This line right here, this word right here after theorem says what theorem we're trying to prove. Usually LOC after is empty. We've inserted some things here so that even if REC cot is defined, we're going to ignore that for the moment. There are many ways to create a proof. You can go forwards, go backwards, start somewhere in the middle. You often have to try various ways to figure out how to make all the pieces fit together. In this example, I'll show going forwards. A key thing in MMJ2 is that you need to enter what you want to prove as the step QED. In this case, I need to prove that for all A's that are a member of the complex numbers, and their sine is not equal to 0, and its cosine is not equal to 0, implies that its tangent is equal to the reciprocal of the cotangent. And this thing right in the front means this is, this is true. Typically, the next step is to add information that you know you'll need. For example, I know that I'm going to need more information about the tangent and cotangent. And for many functions, the name followed by VAL is often very, very useful. So I'm going to pick arbitrarily the number 300 as my step identifier. I'm going to call tanval. Okay. And I'm going to go up to unify. Uh, and that will pull in the tanval definition. Now it will include this working variable. I'm going to replace that with a and do unify again and that will shorten it up to something much simpler. Similarly we'll add information about the cotangent. Now I actually don't have to go up. Control U will do that for me. Control U I don't need a work variable. Place that with A. There we go. These step IDs are completely arbitrary. They don't have to be numbers, they just have to be unique. Now, I have definitions for tangent and cotangent. I need to have something that lets me define what a reciprocal does for me. Uh, so I'm going to go up to search, general search and I'm going to search for something that will tell me about 1 and divide it by and I'm going to use the regular expression format although there's many different forms I could use. Clicked on search found a whole lot of different ones. Some most of these don't look like really what I'm looking for uh, but let's see here this rective thing that looks like exactly what I want. So I'm going to go back here and put in 200 rective. Notice that's complaining that it can't really fulfill this QED step. For the moment, I'm going to put a question mark in there, unify, and that just says that I'm not really ready for it yet. Don't ask me uh, for that information. Now, the tanval and the cotangent val actually don't have exactly the same preconditions. You notice here the precondition for QED is this long string, and for tanval it's a shorter string. So I need to make them match. So I'm going to do this, but I'm, I'm actually going to intentionally make a mistake here. And I'm going to insert this. Now, this is not going to work because it doesn't know what I'm trying to derive it from. If I insert this, now control U, it figured out what the rule was that would let me insert this. Basically, if, the, if this is true for these two conditions, it's true when I add yet another condition as well. Let's do the same thing for cotangent.
I'm using cutting and pasting to make copies. You can also use IDI to make copies like this. Control U, make a copy. We won't do that for the moment though, so I'm going to use Control Z to undo. I should note that under Unify there's a Unify Note Control Work Fairs, Control Shift U. As a side effect, it automatically renumbers things. If you don't like the way I've numbered things, you can do things that way. Uh, but this is the way I number things. So far, our statement about the cotangent has been about the cotangent itself. But our final proof is about is supposed to be about 1 over the cotangent. Well, remember from algebra, whatever you do on the left-hand side, as long as you do on the right-hand side also, you're OK. So we're going to make a copy of 410. Let's uh, call that 420. We're going to base this on 410. And we're going to do 1 over on both sides. Again, as long as we do the same on both sides, we're OK. Control U. There we go. So we've expanded the tangent with the same precondition and one over the cotangent with the same precondition into sines and cosines. Now we need to show that those two sides are equal to each other. So let's look back up here at rec div. Uh, from down here at 420, we see that cosine over 1 over cosine of a sine of a is what we're going to have as the reciprocal. Uh, so in fact, this expression right here is what we're looking at. That last control U filled in a lot. But here's the thing. These preconditions are not exactly the same as the precondition we need. Uh, it says that the cosine has to be a member of the CC, whereas here I'm worried about the actual A value itself. How can I connect its cosine being a member of complex with the value itself being a member of complex? Now we know that sines and cosines produce complex numbers if they're given complex numbers. Uh, so why don't we just enter that in and see if we can find that. So I'll turn style here. And then if A is a member of CC, then its sine is going to be a member of CC. Let's do control U here and see if we can find it. Oh look, sine CL. Ah, and we see a naming convention here. I'll bet if I do cosine CL, yep, and I'm going to replace one of these with A. Good control U again. Excellent. Now I can start simplifying rectiv and making it a lot more like our QED step. So we'll call this 220, building it off 200. I don't know what the name of the justification is. I'm going to let the system figure that out. Replace that with A. But it can't be just 200. It also needs to be based on the definition for cosine. Uh, there we go. going to do the same thing again. But in this case we're going to base it on two on 100 and 220. We'll call this 240 and we'll replace that sign with just a. Excellent. Now, the precondition still isn't exactly the same because I've got an and of ands. There's this and that. This. In fact, these two are now the same, and so I can merge them. How do I know that? 
in general, I found you just try to find very, very small steps and see if the database has them already. So let's start with this 260. This can be based on 240. But now we're going to pull that out. So if A is this, this, this. Now if I type control U, it's going to say, oh, it's got a grammatical error because it doesn't have the right number of parentheses around it. Now it's going to be unhappy because I was telling it that there's this one rule, but in fact that isn't the right rule. Now it's happy. So is everything all set? Not quite. See, so if you look very carefully, it says A is a member of complex numbers, cosine, sine. Oh, the QED says A is a member of C, sine, cosine. Metamath doesn't know a lot about the underlying math. Uh, all it sees, it's going to see is that the substitution won't work because the order is not the same. But this is no big deal. I can easily swap the order. that. This is going to be 280 based on 260 and I'm now going to swap the order. Control U. There we go. Now finally we are at a point where we can start to do something together. So let's pull together 420, 310, and 280. Control U. Ta-da! We have finally proven this. I have not shown many other things that MMJ2 can do, including various features that help you create proofs backwards, but hopefully this is a start. That proof that we just created was actually submitted to uh, said MMM, and this is the generated HTML. So you can see it looks really nice and pretty and it records in a very clear and simple way. It may not look simple, but it really isn't that complicated. It's a whole bunch of substitutions just as we showed earlier. And unlike some math proofs, this one shows very, very specifically all the special conditions in this case that you have to have both the sine and the cosine of the value not being equal to zero. And of course the number has to be a complex number for this to be true. So thank you very much for listening to this introduction. I hope you enjoyed it.